Chamber of Law, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. I'm Carolyn Shapiro, Associate Professor of Law at Chicago Kent College of Law and Director of the Institute on the Supreme Court of the United States, ISCOTUS, and I'm here today with one of my colleagues to talk about the issue of severability in the Affordable Care Act litigation. Um, I'm going to invite him to introduce himself, Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Heyman, and I'm a professor um, here at Chicago Kent. So, Steve, uh, the, the word severability is not exactly self-explanatory. What, what, is, what does it mean? What does it refer to? As you know, Congress passed the Affordable Care Act two years ago uh, in order to expand coverage um, to almost all Americans and also to try to keep health care costs down. And a centerpiece of that law was uh, what's called the individual mandate. It's a provision that requires uh, everyone in the country to purchase um, a, a health care insurance policy um, from a private insurance company. And that's one of the, that is one of the most controversial provisions and the, one of the ones that the Supreme Court is going to be considering uh, whether or not it's constitutional. Exactly. And if the court were to strike down the individual mandate um, and hold that it, it um, goes beyond Congress's powers, then the question is what happens to the rest of the Affordable Care Act? Um, does the court have to strike down the entire law? Um, and that's the, the issue of severability. Can, can Congress signal to the courts ahead of time what it might have in mind? Yes, it can. Uh, sometimes Congress will uh, include what's called a severability clause um, in the law, um, which will say what they want to have happen if the court were to strike down some portion of the law. Um, so it might say that, that if that happens, we want the whole rest of the law to stand. Um, or on the other hand, um, if that happens, we want the rest of the law to fall. Did they um, do that in this case? Uh, no, they didn't do that in this case. Um, so um, Congress was silent on the issue, which means the court itself will have to decide what happens to the rest of the law. So how, what kind of criteria does the court look at to make that determination? Uh, there's actually a pretty well-established test um, on the issue. Um, and it asked the court to, um, to ask two questions. Um, the first question is, can the rest of the law stand on its own? Does it make any sense um, as, as operative law? Um, and if so, then um, the court um, asks whether Congress would have passed the rest of the law if they had known that the other um, provision was going to be struck down. So in this case, uh, the question is, can the rest of the Affordable Care Act function and then would Congress have wanted it to if it had known that this would happen? Exactly. Um, and in this situation, it's pretty clear that the rest of the law could, um, could function. Um, there, there's no reason why um, other provisions of the law could not, in fact, um, be applied. Um, so the question is, would Congress um, have enacted those other provisions if it knew that it couldn't have a mandate? And some of those other provisions include things like requiring employers to provide health insurance to their employees, requiring employers to provide opportunities for women to pump breast milk, those kinds of things that really don't seem to have anything to do with the individual mandate. That's right. And, and those provisions, uh, it's very hard to see how the court would end up striking those down, um, even if it struck down the individual mandate. They, they clearly seem to be severable from the rest of the law. What, but the Obama administration has actually taken the position that there are some provisions that would have to be struck down if the individual mandate fails. Yeah, that's right. Um, the, the Affordable Care Act uh, established a, a very finely tuned mechanism um, for expanding coverage. And, and what it did was to say, uh, on the one hand, um, it told insurance companies that they couldn't deny coverage to you just because you had a, a pre-existing medical condition. Um, and it also told the companies that they couldn't um, charge you more for an insurance policy because you had pre-existing conditions. Um, but um, Congress felt that um, that um, the, the difficulty that would uh, arise there is that um, if you knew that you could always get coverage, um, you might simply um, game the system by um, not, <clears throat> not buying uh, insurance until you actually got sick, and that way avoid having to pay premiums while you were healthy. And the result would be that uh, the insurance companies would be left um, paying for, for very expensive care uh, for sick people without getting the premiums from healthy people um, that uh, they usually rely on in order to spread the costs out and, and to keep costs affordable for people. Um, and that was the purpose of the individual mandate, 
the idea was that um, if um, everyone, uh, healthy as well as sick people, um, are required to buy the insurance, then um, under those circumstances it would make sense to tell the insurance companies that they really do have to cover everyone. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you.